Noah, go ahead and go ahead and fire us off here. Hello, everyone that is joining. Uh, we are just going to give it here a couple of seconds. I've got everything recording and going live on Facebook. So I'm going to give people about 15, 20 seconds here to get logged in. Perfect. Well, um, I'm going to go ahead and kick things off here. Thank you guys so much for tuning in this evening. Uh, this is our second to last webinar. Can't believe we've done six of these already, but um, we definitely uh, have a treat for you here tonight. We're going to be talking about is organic no-till possible? I've heard Keith say numerous times that it's kind of a, the holy grail of soil health. So we've got some experts with us tonight that are going to be talking about what they're doing and there's not a, a silver bullet for things. That does seem to be what everybody's looking for. It's just one thing that can solve everything. And I think what we're gonna to find tonight is that's not necessarily the case, but it is a little bit more attainable than what we've come to, to think about. You know, it's uh, definitely possible and it just takes a little bit of practice and, and talking about it. So that's exactly what we're gonna to do tonight. Uh, Keith, do you wanna go ahead and, well, actually here before you go ahead and kick things off, I will just let you guys know that everyone is muted um, but if you have questions during the presentation at all, we're going to allow you to type those in in the Q&A portion or in the chat. And we'll go till about 6.15 and then open it up to your guys' questions. We are going to do things a little bit differently this evening. Instead of having Dan and Rick uh, give a presentation, this is something that we've got a lot of questions about. And I know that you guys have questions as well. So what we're going to do is have Keith kind of lead a discussion with Dan and Rick about what they're doing and allow them to expand on some of the things that maybe are a little puzzling to us that are, are just getting into it. So with that, uh, Keith, do you want to go ahead and introduce our speakers and kick off the presentation? Yeah, I will. Thank you, Noah. Um, you're, you're right. I, I have often referred to organic no-till or, or the closest we can get to organic no-till as being kind of that holy grail of of soil health, the holy grail being, you know, something that's often searched for, but, but almost never found. Uh, but we've got a couple guys here that, that I think are pretty close. Uh, they're, in fact, I think they have found it. They're, they're still working on some things and they'll talk about that. They'll talk about, you know, some of the struggles and, and things, but let me introduce them and then we'll kind of jump into here. Uh, we have Dan DeSutter. Dan, wave your hand there. Uh, Dan, it, well, both these guys are from Indiana, and actually they don't farm very far apart, uh, which is really great because they can kind of learn from each other. They're not doing exactly the same thing, which, which I think is really cool because what that tells us is that there, there are multiple ways to put these principles into practices, and that's what we're really going to be talking about. Don't take anything that these guys say as a recipe that you can go home and immediately start putting into action on your fields. Some of the things, yes, you will be able to do that, but the whole system, no, nobody can duplicate a whole system in its entirety. So as we're talking here this evening, be listening for how they're putting these soil health principles into practice without using either chemicals or using tillage. And that's that's what organic no-till really is. You know, most organic guys are still using some tillage. Most non-organic regenerative farmers are still using some herbicides, some pesticides. The goal is to reduce those as much as possible, but true organic no-till is not using either one of those. And, uh, and it's really, really hard. And, and they'll talk about the struggles that they've had uh, some of the successes as well as some of the failures. So Dan DeSutter, uh, and, and I'll let each of these guys give a little bit more of their background, but we've been working with Dan, uh, gosh, Dan, what, four or five years probably we've been sending cover crop mixes out to you there uh, in Indiana, just uh, not too far from Lafayette. But yeah, uh, more like seven or eight anyway. Okay, well, time flies when you're having fun, I guess. So we've known Dan for many years. Uh, I'd say he's, he's been real, uh, real innovative and real aggressive at integrating livestock into this process. And they'll, they'll talk about how important that is. So we've known Dan for quite a while. Uh, I have read and heard about Rick Clark for a while. And this summer, uh, Dale Strickler and I took a, 
I'll almost call it a pilgrimage out to visit these guys in, in uh, central Indiana there. And we went to Dan's farm and because Rick farms so close, uh, he was good enough to come over and uh, toured around and I jumped in the pickup with him and got to know him pretty well. Uh, so I haven't actually been to Rick's place, uh, but got to know a little bit of his background. And since then, we've talked on the phone, emailed back and forth quite often. Uh, so I feel like I know his operation, not 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 as much as Dan's, but um, I, I know a little bit about what he's doing just in, in listening to him and, and going back and forth since then. So, uh, Dan, I'm going to just start off with you. Why don't you give us just a little bit of the background? The first question I want to ask you guys and, and for you to share with our audience, because there's a lot of people interested in this. What made you decide to do this? And, and, and for the record, I entitled this Organic No-Till, Is It Possible? Or are these guys just crazy? And so that might be part of the question that you answer We're here. Crazy. And it's probably a little bit of both. You got to be a little crazy to, to kind of go down this path. But, but Dan, you start us off and then we'll go to Rick. Tell us a little bit about what, what drove you down this path. What made you decide that organic no-till is where you wanted to go? Well, if you ask anybody that really knows me, they will confirm that I am crazy. So we don't need to debate that or discuss that anymore. Um, what we've been in no-till, uh, my dad started in 1983. We've been no-till since 1990 and started using cover crops around 2000 and really aggressively for the last 10 years. And it was a CCSI project I'm involved that really made me look hard at organic. I'd thought about it through the years, but just didn't want to do the tillage. And, and when we started to learn about roller crimpers and see how we could do beans and saw how our weed pressure was really declining as we added diversity, it just, the light came on that we may be closer to being able to do this than we think. But probably the deciding factor is that we did some extensive testing on a farm that's been no-tilled and cover crop for 20 plus years, no-tilled 30 years, cover crop 20 years, no synthetic fertilizer besides 28% nitrogen, all manure. And, and in that testing, what we saw is that we weren't changing the biology um, as much as we thought. We'd done physical things. We had added uh, a lot of organic matter, increased uh, aggregate stability and all those things. But biologically, we really hadn't changed the soils the way we'd hoped. And so, can you guys still hear me? You're good, Dan. Okay. Um, so when we started to think about the, the whys of that, and I went through the, the principles and we're trying to manage by these five soil health principles. I don't know if you all heard them, I'm gonna say fast so we're all on the same page because this is our guide. This is our roadmap. And when you're thinking about how we're making decisions, we minimize disturbance. We want armor over living root all the time. We want as much diversity as we can get, and we want ruminant impact whenever we can get it. And so knowing that, that'll help make sense of what Rick and I are going to talk about, because that's really our, our guidepost. Uh, but as I thought through reasons why we weren't seeing our biology improve the way I thought it should, it really became clear that some of the things we were doing were causing disturbances. And we'd always thought of disturbances as physical, but when you start talking about things like glyphosate, fungicides, insecticides, that's a disturbance. And I, I just more and more came to the view that that was what was holding us back. And that if we wanted to take the next quantum leap in terms of regenerating soil and improve our soil health, um, we need to get rid of that stuff. And if you're going to start to do that, then you, you might as well think about how I can get more for my crop. And there's never just one reason, but that was really the big aha moment. And as I look forward to the next generation and trying to create a scenario where where they could, my kids could all come back to the farm. I have three sons that all want to farm. Um, without having to try to farm 10 or 15 or 20 or however many thousand acres that would take in another 15 or 20 years to sustain that, I really wanted to focus on getting more per acre. And um, so there's a lot of things that went into it. But on the soil health side, it was trying to get rid of the things that I felt like were holding us our biology back. Yeah, thanks, Dan. I appreciate that. And, and I love that point that you made about disturbance, because a lot of times when people think of the soil health principles and they think of minimizing disturbance, 
all they think about is I got to eliminate tillage and, and they don't understand or they don't realize or we haven't spent enough time thinking about the chemical disturbances that all those other products that we're adding, even, even fertilizers, you know, can, can cause those disturbances. So that's, uh, I'm glad you really brought that out uh, in what drove you to there. So Rick, tell us a little bit about your background and your story and, and how you ended up on this path. Sure. Well, I'm honored to be here today. Thank, thank you, Keith, for, for inviting me to talk. Um, yeah, you know, way early in, in our journey, Mother Nature has guided, guided me where she's wanted me to go. And I can't thank her enough for that. It was with weather events or, or whatever, whatever the, the, the answer was. But early in our cover crop journey, we were uh, planting green. And that's, that means planting our cash crop of corn and soybeans into a living, growing green cover crop and not terminating until well after we planted. And, and on those early days of journey, we were doing this chemically. And, and, and I'm glad I live close to Dan because Dan has been on this journey longer than I have. And that's where I started kicking my ideas around. And the two of us just started to feed off each other. And then we were blessed to meet a, a wonderful person in Wisconsin, Dr. Aaron Silva. And Dr. Aaron Silva showed us how we could plant soybeans into standing cereal rye at boot stage and roll the whole thing down 45 days later, beans and all. And when that moment happened and I saw it happen for myself, I'm like, okay, we are so close. We've taken away the, the burn down pass. We are now down to just getting enough biomass. And that's what this is all about. Today's talk, Keith, is about biomass. We've got to have eight, nine, 10,000 pounds to be able to suppress these weeds. And, and we have no easy button to go back to. We can't go back and come in and bring a spray and try to save a field. We can't do those things. So, you know, I always say the success of next year's cash crop starts with the success of this year's cover crop. And, and you really got to think about that. And you've got to figure out the region that you're living in. Uh, how do you get those cover crops planted in a timely fashion? So all those things make a difference. But I guess to answer why I did this, it, it, it was that building up of farming green and, and letting these cover crops go way into maturity. And then when you do that, the amount of sequestration that these cover crops do for you is why you become regenerative then because we are recycling these nutrients. So it's just, it all fits together and it all starts to make sense. Yeah, it certainly does. And that's, you know, that's great. You know, I, I, I love how, you know, you came at it from similar reasons or for similar reasons, but I want everybody to take notice that neither one of these guys said, you know what, boy, I was going after that big organic premium because that that's, if that's your driving factor, you're, you're probably really going to fall down and hurt yourself pretty bad in this process. Uh, so that's a byproduct of it. It cannot be the driving factor and the reason that you're going there. Would you guys agree with that? Most definitely. Yeah. yeah. And, and I want to add yeah. something to that. Keith, I want to add something. Um, we have to be very cautious here. If your farm is in any kind of a financial strain, this is not the step you take. You have to be a more on a financial good foundation before you make this move because this is this is tough. I mean, this is this is something that Dan and I will will never step away from. But I, it, the mental drain is unbelievable on this thing, and you better have some financial backing behind you to really get rolling. Dan, would you agree with that? Uh, you know, when I started looking at organic, I asked you know, everybody I knew that knew anything about organic farming, who are the best organic farmers? And then I went and asked their advice, and they all had different advice except for one thing. They all said, start small. And, uh, of course, I didn't listen to that. And uh, it's been really hard getting through transition. You know, the last two years, we've had 1,500, 1,600 acres that 
we really didn't take any income off of. We just used part of our transition time as a regen year. And that's really hard on your working capital. And, and uh, not to mention the lessons as, as we've tried things that we wanted to see if it would work, knowing that they might not, and a lot of them have it. And, uh, you know, it does, Rick's right. It, it is, uh, it's a good thing we've got each other because, you know, uh, we understand what the other guy's going through and we can help pick each other up when we get a little down. So have a good support group would be another piece of advice, I would say, is uh, have someone that's thinking along a parallel path that can help boost you and pull you along when you stumble. Yeah, that, that's a great point. It, it's hard to underestimate how important that is. And, and you guys are very fortunate, you know, that geographically you're quite close. But a lot of people don't necessarily have that. But that doesn't mean you can't find a support group, you know, with all of the online technology that there is now. You know, you can come up with your own online support group and they don't have to be. Now, it, it helps if they're somewhat geographically similar or at least in, in rainfall conditions. Uh, but even if not, you know, still just having some people to bounce ideas off of. So I want to I want to just talk about a couple of other things. Dan, you mentioned everybody told you to start small, but you didn't really listen to them, and you you jumped in pretty big time. One point I want to make about these guys, and 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 you know, some in the audience probably realize this, and some don't. These guys aren't doing this on you know 40 acres, 50 acres, 80 acres, even five, six, seven, eight hundred acres, they're doing this on thousands of acres. They're, and so again, when I think about the people that are doing organic no-till, I know a number of people that are doing this in their garden or they're doing this on 20 acres where they can really put a lot of labor into it. These guys are doing it on, on very large scales and, and you guys don't have to tell us exactly the number of acres, but it's multiple thousands of acres now, it didn't all get transitioned to or, organic no-till or to organic all at once, I don't think. But, um, Dan, you, like I say, you didn't just start with 20 acres to see how it worked. You started with a pretty big chunk. Well, I remember back, my dad was ridge tilling when I came back to the farm. We went to a meeting at Jim Kinsella's and, and we're both really impressed with what we saw. On the way home, you know, we were talking about, okay, this is what we want to do and and my dad wanted to do a few hundred acres at a time. And, and I, I convinced him by the time we got home that, you know what, um, we need to commit to this. And that means getting rid of the ridge till stuff, getting the tools that we need to be successful in this new thing, not trying to do it half-assed. And, uh, and I've always been a believer in that, that when you're ready to commit, commit and, and put yourself, immerse yourself in that. And, and, and I think that, helps you stay with the program and, and commit your full energy to it um, when you burn the bridges behind you. How about you, Rick? Did you go all in or did you kind of go in stages? Well, uh, we started the first year small, uh, 500 acres, and then it, it went quick. Uh, after year two, it, it's into the multiple thousands. So the trajectory that we're on, we're going to be fully certified by 2022. So again, a total agreement with Dan. Uh, once you commit to something, there's no looking back. You have no, you know, you have no excuses. You can't make excuses. You're all in. Let's go. And you know, things like I've always said. If you want to get rid of tillage, if you want to get rid of the the need to do tillage, sell all your equipment. Because then when you don't have it, you can't go out to your back door and hook on and go save a field. Yeah. So that's how you get committed. But it's way deeper than that, though, too, Keith, because now that starts to answer some of the questions. Well, I can't afford to do that. I can't pay for those cover crops. I can't do this. Well, once you sell your equipment off, you've now gained that capital back to help offset some of those steps to get to where you currently are. Um, mm -hmm. When you pull into our farm, and you will be on our farm one day, Keith, you will be, there's no there's nothing in the back lot anymore. It's gone. There is no equipment. There's nothing there. Some semi-trailers. That's it. Yeah, it, it's kind of like the some of the old Spanish explorers when they came over to the to the to the new country here. You know, they literally burned the ships so that there was no return. <laughs> 
I mean, that, that's kind of what you're talking about doing. You're talking about landing almost in a new country and then burning the ships because we're fully committed to making a go here. Right, right. And, you know, I, you know, I don't know where all you want this conversation to go, but I mean, I am to the point where I am so committed. I no longer take crop insurance. I no longer take subsidy payments from the government. Haven't taken any, what are they, CFAP or whatever they're called. Haven't done any of that stuff. That's how, how dedicated I am to making this system, not only making it work, but how much faith I have in it and how it's going gonna, it's gonna to be, what I can see coming, it's, it's going to be well worth the journey. That, that's, the, that's the ultimate freedom to farm right there, isn't it? Because there's absolutely nobody telling you to do anything. You, you have 100% control over everything. So yeah, that's, that's, that's impressive. That's impressive. Um, Dan, why don't I want to I want to move in kind of from the from the theory, you know, of how you got started. I, I want to share with people a little bit about what you're doing to make this work. And again, folks, don't don't be writing down recipes here, but but use it to generate ideas. Um, I was at Rick, Dan's farm and I know Rick had similar things this year. They've had better years than this year. This year, just weather conditions didn't make things, allow things to work quite as well as other years. Uh, so guys, I want you to share some pictures. I know you've each got a few slides that you can share because I wanna give people kind of a background of some of the things that you're doing to put this principle, to put your passions, you know, your passions and your principles into practice, into the ground. So Noah, uh, we, we're having some a little bit of connectivity troubles from Dan's computer, so Noah's going to share Dan's slide slides. And so, why don't you just go ahead and talk about your slides a little bit, Dan, uh, and then we can uh, have Rick share his. So, that's my stuff, Noah. All right. So, it's, I don't know if I have Dan's then. <laughs> That might just be Rick's that I've got. Okay. I will, email. I will look, but why don't you go ahead and, yeah. and I'll, I'll keep looking. Yep. Yeah, Rick, go ahead and share your slide deck. Okay. Uh, let me share the screen here. Um, yeah. I mean, what, uh, what we're trying to do here is, is um, I want to show you where we, where we've kind of been and, and where we're, we're coming from, okay? Um, change is good. Change, can, you can see the screen, is that right? Everybody, everybody think yep. good? Okay. We're good. Okay, good. Change is so, is good and it's so hard to put your brain around. I mean, you've got to first decide that we're going to do something different than the way it's been done on the farm. And I'm not here to put down the way anybody's farming. That's not what this is about. This is about, Change is good, and, and we need to, to make change necessary in our thought, press, thought process, and change is the answer, okay? Now, this is probably one of the most powerful slides that I have in my deck, and what this is is showing stability, and standard deviation is yield. So before, let's look at that left side of that, that screen, that's corn. Before we really got the soil working for us, and it's always talked about, you got to be in this system three, four, five years, and you really start to see these changes take place. That's what's happening here. While we were building up to this, our standard deviation or, or our differences in yield in a, a given uh, field was almost 29 bushels. Today, it's less than five. So we've taken all of the noise out. Uh, same thing on soybeans. I'm going to move quickly through this stuff because uh, Dan wants to get to his stuff and we got a lot to talk about. So let me keep going here. All right. I mentioned earlier that that biomass is critical and I, I'm going to just quickly go up to the to the almost the end here. So this is cereal rye and we took it at 12 inch, 18 inch and 28 inch. And this was going, this is a field of rye that was planted in the fall and was gonna be soybeans planted into it. And this is what, what kind of uh, sequestration we are getting with cereal rye. 
Now move way over to the right and look at this biomass side, 6,800 pounds of biomass. That is what is critical now for the system that Dan and I are trying to, to continue to work on. Um, now, when, when we then came back two months after termination, because I wanted to see how much of this, these nutrients had released from this cereal rye plant back to the cash crop soybeans. So look at that. We know soybeans love potash. They, we, we went from 281 pounds down to 65 is all that was left. So that had been a release and the plants were now taking those in. And now look at our biomass. It's down to 3,500 pounds. My rule of thumb on cover crop supp weed suppression is 70-30. We need to get 70% weed suppression from the cover crop and we've got to get 30% from the, from the cash crop canopy. So by this point in time, we have to have our beans starting to canopy because we're losing the biomass. Our, our, our microbial biome is in overdrive and it is absolutely eating through all of this material. All right, the power of Balanza fixation clover. This is the main staple that we try to get to uh, for planting corn. Now I'm going to stop right here for a moment and I want you to look at these numbers. A lot of people go out on the first warm day of spring and they burn these cover crops to the ground. I'm asking you to please give these legumes more time. Look at from May 20th to June 4th. We went from 75 pounds of in to 114. Then look in four days, we went to 262 pounds of in and 444 pounds of K2O, unreal. Biomass, look where we are on the biomass, 12,700 pounds. Now, luckily I thought to do the same thing on this that I did on the cereal rye. We came back on July 24th, look at the end, 262 pounds now down to 52 pounds. It has released over 200 pounds of in in a little over 40 days. And the biomass is down to 5,400. Now that is, is, you would expect that because on the day that sample was taken, the carbon to nitrogen ratio was 20 to one. Look at that organic carbon, 5,200 pounds per acre. This is what I talk about all the time. We've got to let these cover crops go further into their maturity. I also call this the power of patience because we didn't plant until that June the 8th. The day we took this sample was the day we planted, June the 8th. Okay, this is where it all begins for our system. You've got to get the cover crop established in the fall in a timely fashion. Um, again, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful uh, cover crop. Okay, I just wanna put in just a little bit of a teaser here on the way we're planting corn. Um, we are no tilling corn. This is alfalfa now. So that previous slide was, was uh, a, a cocktail I, I use called Gunslinger. It's got the Balanza fixation clover and, and you can get that from uh, Grassland, Oregon. But this is alfalfa that's been established and we, we, we really like planting into this because you've got all the fuel you need to raise a corn crop. This is difficult though, folks. Do not think you can go out tomorrow and start doing this. This takes a lot of preparation to get to this point. Then we come back behind the planter with a roller crimper. It's an I and J roller crimper. It's got the Chevron pattern from the Rodell Institute. And this is not gonna terminate this, the alfalfa, but this will lay it down and it will give the corn, we hope a fighting chance to get above this corn and take off. And then when this happens, we, we then can get to the corn. Now, this is what I was describing with Dr. Silva, and I'm just about done, Dan, and I'll, I'll hand it over to you. We are no-tilling beans. Now, this is a little past boot stage, because this is May. We had another wet, wet spring. Typically, in our region, this is going to be at the, at the last week of April, first week of May. You're going to plant beans at boot stage, and then we're going to walk away for about 40 days, and then we're going to come 
and you see the planter goes through it just fine. It, it's, it's everyone worries about you can't, can't plant through cereal rye. Yes, you can, goes right through it. Okay, then we're gonna come back in June. And again, this is way beyond anthesis, but it's okay because what's critical here is we cannot exceed the V2 to V2 and a half growth stage of the soybeans. So here's the rye standing. It's the same, I kept the same field coming through here. There's the soybeans. They're, they're at V2, V2 and a half. So they're maybe six, seven inches tall. And there's the, uh, there's the roller. You can see it's very aggressive. It's very aggressive. And there are the soybeans uh, that you're gonna see. And it, it, I can't thank Dr. Silva enough, Aaron Silva at the University of Wisconsin for showing me how to do this. This is what got me started headed down the organic road. There's the soybeans, they're just fine. They're just fine. There's the same field on July 16th. Absolutely amazing. There's no inputs of any kind. I mean, Keith, what we've done here, we've taken everything away. I, I use nothing. I, I am no longer using manure ahead of corn. We are trying to grow all of our nutrients for the corn crop. We're trying to grow it with cover crops. I think we are, are hurting ourselves with big flushes of nitrogen and we're trying to take that away. And I, I prefer the slower release of these cover crops degradating on their own and, and releasing all this out. But I yeah. mean, that right there, folks, is as clean as a field that has was sprayed. So this can be done. Uh, does every field look like this? No, but I think we have answers why. The reason why this field looks like it does is because these cover crops were planted before September the 10th. We had come out of a, either a cereal grain that we did not double crop beans into. We prepped it during this, after the harvest of that cereal grain got to this point, then we can get this kind of weed suppression. I can also show you fields that were absolutely the weediest field in the county and the yields were very poor and it was attributed to planting dates after October 20th. So we're, we're really learning how to, to try to make this system better. We, we, we know what some of the cause and effects are. Uh, I think that's my last slide. I will stop sharing and and uh, there we go. Great. Hey, Rick, just a couple questions there before we move on. Uh, I, I really like what you said uh, earlier. You know, you said that the success of the cash crop starts with the previous cover crop, but really the what you're saying now is the success of that cover crop starts with what happens before it. So you yeah. need to design your rotation to give the cover crop time to do its job. You can't plant cereal rye October 15th and then blame, you know, blame no stand on the cereal rye. Tell us a little bit about the, the seeding rate that you're using at that time of the year. And have you seen, I know you've experimented a lot with seeding rates. Have you seen differences in, in varying that seeding rate, especially planted that early? Yeah, um, when you can get, you know, what I'm trying to shoot for is at least 30 days before that, 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 that hard froster and if, the, and if we can get to 45. So now I don't care where you are sitting at in the world. If you know what that time period is, back it up. And now we're talking. Okay. So let's back up that 45 days. We could got with that picture right there, we got away with a hundred pounds of Elbon cereal rye. And we are only planting variety specific rye because we want it all to mature at the same time so that we can lay it down with the roller cramper. Okay. Now, as time marches forward and moves on, we have to start moving the rates up. So now what we've even done and, and, and you know what, I, events like this are awesome because you never know this, this, this networking, there's so much information that comes out of this. I'm speaking to a crowd in Ohio last year and Jay Brandt is in the, is in the crowd and Jay, and I ask a question and Jay says, why don't you broadcast some of your cereal rye? Boom. That's exactly what we're doing now because my question was, we're on a 10 inch row spacing on our drill. I think we need to get better canopy in between those 10 inch rows Jace raises his hand and says, whatever your goal is on your, on your, 
your total target amount, why don't you put a portion of that out as a broadcast? That's what we're doing now. So after October 1st, we're laying down 50 pounds of Elbon broadcast and we're drilling 100 pounds with a, with a 10 inch uh, John Deere air seeder. So 150 pounds is where our journey has taken us because like I said, we have no easy button to push here. We have to get our suppression with that cover crop. Mm -hmm. and, and really with the cereal rye, you've got two modes of weed suppression. A lighter amount of rye will probably suppress the winter annuals, but it will not leave enough biomass to give you that weed suppression deeper into the season, like what, what you guys are needing. Right, and let me throw something out there. I've got a notion that, you know, one of the things that's always said is if you've got a broadleaf problem, plant cereal rye, you won't have that broadleaf problem anymore unless you got gaps or holes in your cover crop. I think what's happening, you go back to my slide I put up there. I think cereal rye is sequestering the nutrient load that those early maturing weeds need. And we we buckled them at their knees. And now that cereal rye is, is at an advantage and it can hold those broad leaves down then as it goes later on in the season and it's releasing that nitrogen back, now that's, that's the fuel for the foxtail. And that's what we're seeing now, those late season weeds coming into play. I think all this ties into each other. So now we have to start thinking about different trigger times and different trigger points and start changing the way these weeds are, are adapting to the, to the environment that they're in. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. You're, you're literally starving those weeds of the nutrients that they need, but you're also, you know, you fundamentally change the biology of your system. And, you know, I would guess that you have uh, a lot more fungally dominated soils and, you know, when you were farming conventionally and most weeds do not grow well on that type of soil. That's correct. Our, our Haney tests, we do them all the time. We do them twice a year. Our farm has moved from a bacterial-based farm to a fungal-based farm very quickly by using these techniques. Yes. Yeah. Great. Noah, do you did you find Dan slides? No, we're we're still having trouble getting those slides up. Uh, we do have the option if he if we need to just share it on his iPad, we can. Otherwise, um, yeah, we. I don't know if Dan, if you want to just kind of talk about what you've got for slides on there. Hey, Dan, can you hear me? I'm not sure Dan can hear us now. Yeah, I think his connection is kind of flitting in and out there. I'm back. I'm back. Okay. There you go. Are we good to go? Yep. Yep. Yeah, I'm going to hide my video so yours can be a little bigger. Rick, why don't you go ahead and hide your video while Dan shares his slides here? Okay. Okay. Yep, you're good to go, Dan. How do I make mine bigger? I'd like to get it full screen. I guess that'll have to do. Um, okay, so this, this first one is just, you know, I've always thought when I can walk out my fields and see fungi growing it, I'm probably down the road of creating the kind of environment we're looking for, for mycorrhizal fungi, which are really a foundation of the system we're trying to create. So uh, I just included that picture just because that makes me smile when I see that. Um, I'm just gonna talk about beans real quick here because we've all been around no-till organic beans. And again, I'll echo Rick, uh, kudos to Erin Silva because she has really helped us get the confidence to go down this road that I don't know if we ever would have had without her. Uh, thank you, Erin. Um, so this year we had kind of a different, we've been rolling and, and, and doing this six years and, and uh this year 
I see my hand there. The Fully. And so we're waiting and waiting and waiting and, and then more time when we come post emerge. This year we had more like 50 and um, you see how it's gooseneck crook where the roller hit it. Uh, it really affected, I think, the, the vigor of our plants. So um, I still don't understand what was different about this year that made that work that way, but uh, it really hampered our bean growth early and uh, um, something we hope we don't see again. So on to, uh, on to corn. Uh, this is a picture of my son, Damon, standing out in a field. Uh, this is our uh, diverse perennial organic strip till experiment. And we've got over, I think, right at 10 species of plants uh, perennial plants out here. We've got uh, a couple different clovers, everlasting clover, Dutch white clover, uh, perennial ryegrass, some different fescues, uh, uh, a lot of things coming out of uh, the orchard industry. They're low growing. We want to cool season things that will tend to want to go dormant, uh, like Kentucky bluegrass uh, when it gets hot. But this is this is what it looked like before uh, the next step here, we would have came in and we would have mowed this and then we strip tilled it to clear out a strip and then we plant it. Um, so you can see the kind of biomass creation, like Rick said, that's the whole key to this. You, you've heard of a plant-based diet for people. Well, we're trying to have a plant-based diet for our crops and it all starts with generating biomass. And, and this perennial thing may be a little crazy, but when you think about what would be ideal in terms of the uh, five soil health principles, um, this checks all the boxes. So it's worth trying. And uh, it's been a struggle so far, um, but uh, we're showing improvement. Um, this is a picture of, uh, you know, where you see the corn plant. If you really look right in the history, and the corn plant. But the, the crop in between have rebounded and uh, gotten a little bit above them. So probably within a day or two here, we're coming in with the Romo and we're going to mow this down to try to get that corn plant uh, headed out above um, the, the cover crops. Uh, one thing we've learned, uh, we've included plantain and chicory in our mixes because we, we like the diversity and their ability to bring up deep minerals but they really don't play well with corn. So I would say uh, leave the plantain and chicory out of your, of your corn mixes if you're gonna try this. Um, this is the corn as it finally gets to V5 and can start to feed off the roost. You can see it's, it's looking a little rough. We had really dry June here and the corn really struggled initially to get going. Uh, this is a little, a couple of weeks later, starting to look like a cornfield. Uh, this is a harvest shot. Um, last year, this same experiment in this same field, uh, we didn't even bother harvesting it. We bailed it up. This year, we did get a harvest, and uh, I think it made 75 bushels, no inputs. So not terrible, not what we're looking for. Um, in both years, we've had really dry June. So we had young seedlings competing for resources with all these live covers. And um, one of the things we're gonna try to do is get planted sooner. So hopefully that plant can come up uh, with better moisture and, uh, and get going a little stronger before the dry spell hits, have a better root system to be able to go down and get the moisture. Um, this is just looking down Again, you can see the green down between the rows. As soon as the corn comes off, we've got our green growing uh, covers right back at it again. There's, there's no gap. Um, this is another approach we've taken. This is an alfalfa field that we use to transition. And then uh, uh, after the last cutting last fall, we went in and uh, planted rye and uh, some other stuff, but rye is really the only thing that survived. Um, and what we're planning into, what we're rolling down here is 
about at least three, closer to four tons of dry, uh, dry matter and making a nice blanket for the soil. Uh, we tried this a couple different ways. In this field, we came in and strip tilled it and then we're planting into the strips. Um, we also uh, had some fields where we planted straight into it and then rolled it. So we had straight no till and then rolled it. Um, both um, had good and bad with both. This is one of the fields that uh, is, was no tilled. Um, and I should say this year, one of our challenges, we had prolific armyworm flights. And so about two thirds of our organic corn had to be replanted because the armyworm just ate us alive. Cereal rye is a great attractant for armyworms. Um, so we, uh, uh, this field that we're looking at, uh, I think was replanted June 18th. And uh, I could say straight back into the alfalfa and rye. And uh, occasionally we get, uh, those are my two sons on the side, Dylan and Damon, uh, two older sons. Uh, that guy in the middle, I think most of us recognize. But look down in there, this is what's going between the rows. We're already starting to green back up. This is a little later. Um, and that's what we want. We want that continuous, we, we always want something growing out there if we can, that's our goal. Um, so this is a picture of our first day in the field with an inner row crimper. Something we're hoping can take the place in a lot of situations of a cultivator. And uh, let's see it going through. It's, this is a field that had already been rolled once and we've replanted it and the corn's come back up down in there and we're just testing here. Um, it's doing an okay job there. What we learned right out of the gate is that we need more weight on this tool to make it work. Um, here's a picture where we're going through uh, some different stuff, but you can see the water tank in the middle. You can see the case weight on the wings. Um, we finally got enough weight to really be able to, to do the job. And we found we could, we could sever horse weeds and different things with this once we got the weight on it. So it'll do a pretty good job on a lot of things, but not very effective on uh, annual grasses. That's our nemesis. And then the last technology we're working on trying to develop that's a little unique is, uh, is a Romo. And uh, it, 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 it's not um, um, as robust as we'd like it, but we've got it to where it'll work pretty good. And uh, it just gives us another way to go out there to avoid a cultivator at, at certain times. So um, that's my, all my slides, guys. All right, thank you, Dan. Um, yeah, and, and you know, I like I say I got to see some of that this summer. Uh, saw that you know the perennial mix that you planted that corn into, and the row mo and the inner row crimper in action, and uh, you know, just just really impressive. Uh, not only the management systems that you guys are putting in place, but the creativity that you're coming up with uh, to develop some of these tools, because you know, even five six years ago a lot of these tools weren't even available that are helping you uh, do some of these because as you lose tillage as a tool, as you lose herbicides as a tool, we still have to have tools. So we have to replace that, you know, with both tools and management. So guys, we could go on forever here with, with you guys sharing slides and information, uh, such good stuff. I know there's a ton of questions. So Noah, why don't you go ahead and start? Uh, I'm going to hide my video. I'll let you come on. Why don't you go ahead and start uh, curating some of the questions out to, to Dan and Rick there. Uh, we'll see how many of these we can get through. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we'll start off here with Ruth asks, is your perception of risk because you had more to lose versus uh, a beginning younger farmer? And add, sorry guys, you do have a bit of gray showing. <laughs> go ahead. I'm not man. sure I understand the question. Well, I think what she was asking about when it was in reference to uh, not starting off 
you know, jumping right into it. And maybe Dan, you're the wrong person to ask when it comes to that. But uh, was there more risk because you were largely into that at that point? Or is it um, more to lose as a beginning younger farmer? Well, I think what Rick referenced in terms of having um, a strong financial position is that just the transition alone is taxing because you're, you're, you're probably going to see you'll drop. I mean, remember these soils, we've done everything for them for 50 years and now we're asking them to do everything for themselves and the tools and the, and the microbes and the, and the, the mycorrhizal fungal systems, those networks, we've killed them off and now it takes time to bring them back. So there is a lull, a uh, drag, I think, initially in this system. And part of it's us learning how to manage it. And part of it is the soil trying to um, come out of its detox and, and start to respond to uh, providing for these plants so that we don't have to. And, and so between those two, you know, you see a pretty good drop in cash flow. And, um, you know, uh, to the extent that older farmers, uh, I guess I'm being called an older farmer now, um, may have built a little more cushion. It, it does make it a little easier to weather that storm. But I would say anybody can do it, but just, uh, it's like, in, I'm a former commodity broker. When you trade, they always talk about trading within your means. And I would say the same thing applies here. Um, transition within your means. And if, you, if you've got enough cushion and, and want to be more aggressive, great. But if you're a young farmer and you really want to get started on this, just, start at a level that you can afford to have a disaster to and not wipe you out. That's the important thing. Okay. Um, what did you guys use to determine the soil biology and what were you comparing it to? Rick, do you want to start with this one? Uh, I have to thank Rick Haney for this one. He's got a tremendous uh, test that shows the biological life of your soil, the health of it. And we've been doing testing, I don't know, maybe six years we've been doing his testing. We do it twice a year and we take it in, in the, at, at, the, the locations are geospatially marked. So we're going back to the same location every time. And we're going to three locations in a field, the highest produ producing part of the field, the worst producing part of the field and the average producing part. And we're pulling three samples from each field and we do that twice a year and then we track what we're getting back from their tests and I will say one thing I think the lab that you send it to could give you different results so I, you got to be careful on who you're using and where you're sending that to but the Haney test has been very important to see um, the soil health. Okay Dan do you have any uh, anything else to add to that? Uh, ditto kudos to Rick Haney to try to look at soil fertility like a plant would. I think that's really important. Um, and the other thing I would add, you asked what made us realize, well, you know, when you look at things like fungal bacterial ratios, which comes from the PFLA test, I think that's another test we use to look at fungal populations. Um, when you look at uh, the, 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 the ability to, um, oh, what do they call it? The, the Solvita test, the burst, all these things are good indicators of biological activity. And in our case, I mentioned the CCSI project. We had a field that had been no-till 30 years, like I said earlier, 20 years of cover crops and uh, mostly manure for fertility. And we sampled, we had areas within that field that were blocked out with no cover crops for part of this test. So we had within our field, we had cover crop, no cover crop. And then we had a neighbor's field, same soil type, but managed conventionally that we also sampled. And that's where we really saw that biologically, we weren't that much different from the conventional tilled field. And that was really discouraging for me and really caused me to, to take a long look at what we were doing and try to figure out why it was that we hadn't made the strides that I've seen other people make. Okay, uh, Doyle asks, have you ever had a field flat out fail and why? I'll start with that because the answer is definitely yes. Uh, 
I mentioned our perennial field the first year. We had a really wet spring. Uh, we weren't able to plant till about the 10th of June. And then from the 15th of June until the 23rd of August, we basically didn't have any rain. And so you had this young corn plant competing with these established perennials. And, you know, some of the plants actually died. Uh, they look like a pineapple field. And by the time August rolled around, it was apparent there wasn't going to be any grain to harvest. So, but we did have a lot of biomass that started back in. Once it did start raining, we went ahead and took a, a cutting of hay off of it. And so that was zero yield. We had another field that year, same type perennial experiment that, that we grazed. So um, that's one of the advantages of having the livestock in the system is it does give us the ability to utilize things. Even a disaster has some value. Um, so those are probably our two worst disasters so far. Yeah, I, I would agree. They're, they're, I don't like to use the word failure. I like to use things like that was an outcome we didn't quite expect. Uh, we can learn from failures, but I understand what the, the question is all about. And oh yeah, and my answer is back to the cover crop. When was it established? We didn't get that, you know, for whatever reason. I mean, this spring was, 2020 has been hard in many, many, many ways. Dan had army worms, we had black, black cutworm. We had a frost way late in the spring. It affected the way the cereal rye tillered. I mean, all of these things are out of our control. Uh, we can only do what we can do. And, and sometimes, you know, uh, mother nature throws a curveball, and you gotta, you gotta be able to roll with it. So again, it goes back to that, that financial foothold where you, you've got to be able to have X amount of percent of your acres could be a zero, maybe not a zero, but less than desirable so that you can carry the load on the rest of the farm. Uh, Scott asked, do you have problems with herbicide drift from neighbors? And if so, how do you deal with that? Um, we, on all of our organic fields, we leave a 30 foot buffer around all our edges. And we use that for pollinator habitat as we're trying to establish a, a diverse uh, community of, of insects, uh, a balanced community. And so, um, so far we really haven't had any issues. Uh, we, we have had, um, you know, close calls, but uh, that's, that's, that so far has served us well. Uh, we have a lot of fields where we're our neighbors. So that helps a lot too. Yeah, same thing. We, you know, with the, with the organic uh, certification, you have to have buffer areas between your neighbor's cornfields uh, for the cross pollination. Same thing. We've been doing pollinator strips around them. With, it's, a, it's a mix of annuals because these strips are moving around the farm every single year. So, yep, it's good to have those pollinator strips. They bring in a lot of beneficials. So speaking of the, uh, the pollinators there, Ken asks, how are you terminating that balanza clover? The, the balanza clover, the reason why we picked balanza fixation clover, well, many reasons. As you can see on my, my slide, it fixes a lot of in and it, it's sequestering a lot of nutrients, but it has a hollow stem about the size of your pinky. And when it is rolled at the correct growth stage, we can terminate it with that roller crimper with the chevron it just it's, it's like take a straw put it in between your your two fingers and 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 pull it down it's kind of the same the same concept you know at the outset um keith talked about the holy grail if there is a holy grail to organic no-till corn it may well be balanza fixation clover because of its ability to produce the nitrogen and biomass for weed control, and because of our ability to terminate it without chemicals or tillage. The challenge with it is getting it to survive an in Indiana winter. Uh, we often go through a big part of winter without snow cover, and so we get these Arctic blasts. We get these two inch rains in January on frozen ground. We get, you know, ponding a little bit here and there, and then, uh, you know, things freeze. So, um, if you can figure out how to get balanza clover planted at the right time and get it to survive winter, 
then no-till organic corn is very doable. Yeah, and I want to jump in there, Dan, and dovetail you there. A lot of the things that Dan and I talk about are what he just said. Okay, what are we going to do to get, when, first of all, what are we thinking? September 1st is probably the, the premium date to be planting Balanza fixation clover. How do we accomplish that? We have acres that go to regen. That means there's no cash crop. We are strictly building the biology in that field and setting it up for that timing event to be successful with the fixation clover. What we found on our farm, and again, Dan's right, those clippers come down from Canada and can ruin all your plans. But if we can get to third trifoliate in the fall, we can probably have success with that clover next spring. How do you do that? Cereal, cereals and do not double crop. All these things make differences on the success for next year. So totally agree with Dan. It is a tremendous uh, legume, tremendous. And uh, we just gotta, we gotta make sure we got it next spring. It, uh, it is 6.30, but I wanna get to just a couple of last questions here. I'm gonna try to lump them up as far as categories. You mentioned the roller crimping. Uh, Tyler asked, can I use a mower on my cover crop earlier to start or do I need to use a crimper? Uh, he's still conventional. And then kind of a follow up to that. Do you think, Jeremy Brown asked, do you think that rolling covers will work in a dry climate from an organic cotton farmer in West Texas? Bye. Um, so my take on that would be the difference. We have a flail chopper that we use in certain situations. I think um, it can be a great tool. It's going to, one of the things that's going to change is how quickly your, your mat of residue is going to break down. If you flail chop, you're going to get a faster breakdown and a quicker nutrient release pr probably than if you crimp roll. So if your goal is feeding that plant early, it's probably better. If your goal is biomass and we control later into the season, then it's probably gonna hurt you. So I don't think there's a one size fits all there. Uh, both are tools that we want in our arsenal and have a place. As far as the working in, in drier climates, you know, one of the benefits of, of crimping and rolling down all this biomass is that we cut off the, the evaporative loss quite a bit. Um, I don't know that it's zero, but it's certainly a heck of a lot less than a tilled field. And we maintain our moisture. And I've seen times where we've been two or three weeks without rainfall in the summer and 80, 90 degree temperatures, and it's bone dry and cracking in tilled ground. And you can go out under these crimped uh, cover crops and, and it, there's still moisture there. So I think it would really be an asset in that way. Right. Totally agree. Okay, uh, this will be the, the last question here. Um, let me just get to who said that. Dave Gifford said, our fields are very full of grass seed and weeds from their organic transition. I'm hoping to have some suggestions for getting fields clean enough to go no-till. Well, my opinion on that is I, I'm, not, I'm not worried about the weeds, uh, to be honest with you. If we eliminate tillage, we're not re-germinating those weed seeds. They're staying on the surface. They're degradating. They're being eaten by, by microbes. They're being eaten by rodents. I think it's just the, the normal, uh, uh, what's the word? It's uh, um, can't think of the word I want. It's the normal progression to move through that and have grass, but now grass is on our farm everywhere now. Foxtail is our nemesis, and I'm not quite sure on that one yet, but I, I think if we can stop tillage altogether, a lot of these weed problems go away. Yeah, to echo what Rick's saying, I think there was research done at Iowa State um, and they showed that if you leave weed seeds on the surface, 99% of them are gone within three years. So, um, you know, a lot of the weed issues that we've experienced both conventionally and organically probably have more to do with tillage than anything else. And uh, the whole notion that we're going to control 
weeds by controlling the weed seed bank, well, it's one of those, how's that working for you? And I don't care whether you're organic or otherwise, uh, we, we see that uh, not being very effective. So, you know, our strategy is to try to leave those on the surface for the insects, the birds, the worms, uh, the rodents, everything can eat them and, and, uh, and hopefully do some sanitation that way. The other thing I would recommend that, that you know, is very helpful, alfalfa is a tremendous crop. If you've got a really weedy mess, a couple years alfalfa, where you're out there mowing every 21 to 25 days and, and, and not having to do any tillage is a great way to clean up a field and reduce your pressure. Okay, well, with that, um, we are gonna wrap up. Thank you guys so much for your time. Um, there was obviously a ton of questions that we did not get to. So what I'm gonna do is if you guys um, have questions that you really wanna get answered, you can email those to me. My email is noah, N-O-A-H, at greencoverseed.com. And then I can compile those questions and get them sent to Dan and Rick. That way they can uh, hopefully get those answered for you. Thank you guys so much for your time. Uh, I do want to, to give Rick here a little shout out. He's got a, a website. If you guys want to go learn more about what he's doing, especially on the, the consulting side, that is www.farmgreen.land. And you can follow him as well at farmgreen13. And Dan, I uh, apologize if there's a, a place you'd like me to, uh, to plug as well. We can get that on the, the recording of this. This was recorded and we'll have that up later this week. So if you think that there are people that um, would find value in this conversation, please share that with them. Next week, we will have the, the grand finale with Dale Strickler. He's going to be talking about restoring the skin of the earth, uh, kind of looking at the drought resilient farmer aspect of that. So with that, Dan and Rick, thank you guys so much for your time. Do you guys have any closing thoughts? Well, without getting too in depth, I think the foundation of what we're trying to do here all revolves around soil biology, getting mycorrhizal fungal networks reestablished, getting the zootobacter bacteria and all those natural systems that used to allow the soil to provide for itself uh, back in place. And it's kind of a, we're hoping it, it, it largely it's a build it and they will come type thing. And Rick mentioned that there are certain behaviors that probably are counterproductive, you know, like heavy doses of manure, you know, but we're trying to do everything we can to rebuild those soil infrastructures that can do the work for us. Yeah, I'd like to end with um, change is good and I know that's hard and we're stuck in our ways, but, but we have to step out of the comfort zone a little bit and if you don't, I mean, folks, I, my kids were just in diapers yesterday and now I have grandchildren. So, I mean, time goes fast. We have to step out and start change now. And I also want to say one more thing, Keith. Uh, Keith Burns at Green Cover Seed, they have everything under the sun. If you want to uh, go on a quest to try to stump him with something, I don't think he can because they've got every species there is available. You can come up with forage packages. You can come up with cocktails for uh, corn crops. You can come up for cocktails for soybeans. You can, you can, you can get whatever you need to. Uh, Keith may not be able to talk to you personally, but there's somebody there that's going to be able to help. And I'm telling you, they've got a, a very good website including Balanza Clover, if we're going to shout out a, a nice plant there. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. I wanna, and, you know, and if we can't find it, if, if we don't have it, we'll go looking for it. If it's out there, we'll try to find it. Yeah, I want to echo that a little bit. The thing that drew me to green cover, you know, why did I go to Nebraska to buy cover crop seed? Well, initially it was the Smart Mix Calculator, and that is one of the best tools to really learn and begin to visualize and think about how putting together mixes to accomplish a variety of goals can work. And uh, I just, that's, that's been fundamental to our ability to, to, to do better and better at reaching our goals. So um, a great tool, if you guys haven't done it, I, I really highly recommend that. It's free.
Couldn't yep. have said it. Couldn't have said it better if we paid you to say that. Thank you guys. <laughs> we appreciate that. I know my my only closing thoughts is, folks. I appreciate you jumping in on this. Uh, my guess is we're not done with these guys yet. I think we're going to be bringing them back for some encore performances. Don't know exactly what that looks like or when. Uh, but there's too much knowledge here that obviously we're not going to cover it in one session. So we'll be looking at how to, to best uh, roll out additional information from uh, both Dan and Rick down the road. So guys, thank you so much. Uh, have a merry, very Merry Christmas and uh, we will be talking to you soon. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you guys. Y'all have a wonderful evening. We'll see you next week at 530 for Dale Strickler. Take care.